What do you got? <laughs> You were war criminals in Vietnam. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, we am sorry about the delay in uh, getting started. Our speaker tonight decided to come in person. Once he went to Dapper's West instead of Dapper's East. So she's now coming to get to Dapper's East. And um, tonight's topic is going to be about plastics and its recycling. I do have some addendum material that we can present in lieu of her getting here so that we can move on from here. And uh, there will be a $3 charge for this um, due to the restaurant things. All right. The College of Complexes consists of the following rules. Number one, it's one pool at a time, and two, it's no personal attacks. My name is Tim. I'm helping to moderate the meeting tonight. And uh, if we are now going to go into our announcements period, then we'll have our speaker who will present, and then we will have our question and answer period. Um, I hope our speaker can get here within the next hour or so, but we do have several uh, items that we can pull up for the recycling of plastics. And we will talk about that topic tonight. I know there's, uh, it does happen from time to time with our speaker. She's yeah, she's coming. She's coming in person, but she's a little lost. Where is she at? Madison, Illinois? She's coming here. Oh, let's get Jim, that microphone doesn't sound very good. The microphone isn't very good, Tim. Okay, no, he's not. All right, I'll get. I'll have to get another battery in this microphone. All right, Charlie, we're gonna call it. You know. All right, Charlie, go ahead with the announcements. All right, as Tim indicated, our speaker is on our way, and we are going to proceed with the program. We get with our announcement period, and. If she hasn't arrived by then, I'll commence to speak on plastics. I purchased the copy of the book that she was easy relied on, and I've been the secretary of the Greens. Anyhow, welcome everyone to the. Let's see where are we at. Um, I, I got to get the screen shared, Charlie. Having some technical issues right now. All right, let me know when I can go. Okay, Charlie, we got the we got the Zoom screen up. We got All it. All right. Welcome everyone to meeting number three thousand seven hundred and sixty-four of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, let's see now. Um. Uh, uh, we're getting into May. May 4th will be the next upcoming meeting. And we're going to welcome Joe Kopsik as our special May Day speaker. He's going to talk about why the free market isn't free, how it's a rigged economy in the United States, and why we should repeal the Taft-Hartley Act. And he's got a whole list there of seven items which you can look through that he's going to be talking about, anarcho-capitalism, things like that. Should be an interesting program. On May the 11th, D. Knight, author and activist from out of town, will be talking about his new book called A Realistic Path to Peace. We sure need that. Anyhow, he's always an interesting character. Anyhow, life, life of uh, activism in multiple areas but he's got his book is from genocide to global war how we can stop it on may the 18th we're going to have two expert speakers two of them for a discussion of nuclear waste materials on red by rail transport uh, and the dangers of nuclear reactors David Kraft of, of NEIS and Kevin Camps of the Radioactive Waste Watchdog Group 
two experts on May 18th. On May the 25th, our own Andy Anderson and Tim Bolter will be talking about voter suppression and the plot to steal the 2024 election. This is a very important topic. Everyone should attend this. How uh, they're going to try to steal the election since they just didn't succeed last time. A lot of discussion in the news on this. I've heard any, any number of meetings I've been to. So it, it appears to be a very realistic plot that they have. Uh, Heritage Foundation and things like that. On June the 1st, a young man, Mr. O'Donnell, will be joining us again. And he, was, he looked around and he goes, life is not financially fair. There's a basic social stratification. And he, everyone he asks, no one gives him an answer. So maybe we at the college can give him an answer on June the 1st. On June the 8th, uh, this is, we're going to have uh, the migratory bird monitors. These are people trying to ensure that the flight path of the birds in and through the Chicago region is without incident. Should be an interesting thing. The lights are misdirected by the uh, lights. I know that having worked downtown, there were several occasions we'd see birds that would go into flight into high rise buildings and windows, reflections. So an interesting group, been around for a number of years and a very experienced speaker. On June, June the 15th, our own Sid Cohen, probably our most senior member at the college, I believe in terms of number of years attending, always, always well-informed. We'll be talking about the dialectic materialism of Marxism. And he maintains that this it is what reflects reality. So let's there, you can see, you can read the chart there. It'll give you some explanation of what exactly a dialectic materialism is. Uh, it's a process. Okay, on June the 22nd, we just booked this. Um, Kim Sai, a long term, he's an academic, um, but he uh, is going to talk about the climate crisis and specifically regarding capitalism. And he wonders if humans or animals or plants will survive. Anyhow, it should be a good program um, on the 22nd. On the 29th, um, we're going to have, uh, this is a local gentleman, Ud Spires. He operates a group called Restore Democracy. But he's going to talk about Project 25 Ooh. out of the Heritage. Foundation. I highly recommend visiting his website, but he's unveiling a blueprint of uh, that the, the conservatives are all set to take over the country. And they got it all outlined, every agency of the government. It's a master plan in quite some detail. Okay, traveling into July. Okay, let's get July up there. I'm kind of, it's it's a slow but uh, there we go. All right, we got it. We're gonna have I will be the special independent state speaker, and I'm working on this. I already got the draft done, but I'm gonna talk about 25 mistakes that we have made as a nation, and it's not just pointing out the mistakes. This is not a negative program, but it's a blueprint. I'm gonna give you how we need, how, what corrective measures we should undertake in each of these. So it's a positive thing. I could rephrase it this way. 25 things we need to do to bring this country to be number one and to be a wonderful place in which to reside and restore the American dream. So think of it that way, 25 things. Now, other thing is everybody who tends can articulate one or more things that they think mistakes that we have made as a country. And you should offer a solution to that. What mistakes have we made throughout its history 
as a nation. Okay, that leaves two open dates. Um, what about the Oh, I left that guy out. This guy's from the Art Bell Coast to Coast program. He was on the other night. But Mike Landman, he's got a video out on geoengineering, chemtrails, 5G. He also signs, sells clothing and apps to repel energy from 5G. He's got all kinds of things to talk about. He even has to talk for two hours. I said, no, you got to keep it down, my friend, to an hour or so. But he's got a lot of things to talk about. Uh, geoengineering, attempts to control the weather, and chemtrails that are flying all over the skies. It's been a number of years since we've covered this topic, and he's got a new video coming out uh, on, called Franken Skies. That leaves July 20th and 27th. If anybody would like to speak, please send me a title and a description of your program. Okay, Tim, that's it for the announcement. All right, give me a second. We'll get up there and uh, I take it. Anybody chance. else have an announcement? Anybody else have an announcement for uh, come on up? We're going to get you hooked up on the mic and we'll uh, get you ready to go. Um, come on up and we'll do it from here. I got the sound taken care of now. Charlie's going to make an intro on it. We're going to wait for her to get up here and now. No, well, like everybody probably hears me. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, well, we're going to let Charlie kind of start oh. off. All right, go ahead. Dennis, go ahead. Um, on May the 30th, at the night with the experts, it will, it's a Zoom meeting, and our speaker will be from uh, California. There, uh, two speakers, their name, uh, their partners, their name is uh, Helen Jacquard and uh, Jerry Condon. And uh, they run this boat. I'll show you. Yes. And um, uh, she really had. <laughs> I really don't want to interrupt your conversation. So for you. I don't want to interrupt your conversation. It's really rude for me to just stand up here and interrupt when you're speaking. <laughs> okay, Mike, let her speak. Um. Anyway, uh, the, they they were on the Golden Rule Peace Boat. It left Minneapolis, went down the Mississippi. Uh, went around Florida, up the coast to the Hudson River, into Lake Ontario, and uh, then from Lake Ontario, they went into, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I think Lake Erie comes first, and then Lake Ontario, and then um, the, and then Lake Michigan. They ended their run in Chicago, and um, this is a function of the Veterans for Peace. So Veterans for Peace are the people who run the um, the whole idea of the uh, Golden Rule Peace Boat. So that will be on May 30th. And if you want to know how to get into the meeting, you can ask me. Any more announcements? Any more announcements? All right. Uh, since there are no more announcements, uh, we lost our chair someplace, I guess. Uh, all right, I'll begin. It's coming. Yeah, he stepped out of it. I went to get batteries. Charlie, what's that? All right. Seeing as how there's no more announcements, uh, Charlie, you said you're going to wait until Janice gets here. Charlie? Yes. Yeah, all right. All right, let's introduce Charlie Paydock right now. Our speaker is en route, so 
I'm going to let you speak, Charlie. Go ahead and uh, I'll put you on the thing. If you need to do anything, go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, let, by way of background, let me give some information. Since around 1980, actually before that, I've been affiliated with the Chicago Greens and any number of other uh, ecological organizations. I, I have completed training by the Al Gore Academy and, a, and as a certified instructor on climate change and global warming. I, I won a scholarship to that on the basis of my activities and on call give lectures regarding global warming from different perspectives that people are interested on. So I've been dealing with the topic, ecological topics, uh, for many, many years. Uh, and keep up with other ecological organizations. Uh, but now regarding plastics is the hot topic right now. And I, it's way overdue. Uh, Coca-Cola, I'll, I'll give you a little bit about the soft, soft drink industry. But I do know that Coca-Cola eliminated glass bottles. Remember, we used to have glass bottles that we would get deposit and bring them back to grocery stores. But the glass bottle was phased out, from what I understand, around 1975. Uh, before that, we also have metal containers, which began around 1959, aluminum in particular. But then the, the introduction was, as I say, in the mid 70s, was the plastic bottle for soft drinks. Now, of course, everyone is aware that the, the water, allegedly the clean water uh, habits and purchases have accelerated phenomenally. And the, uh, the Swanee and other Coca-Cola type companies uh, are doing incredible amounts of sales regarding uh, drinking water in plastic containers. Now, the thing about plastics, by the way, here's the book. Uh, I purchased a copy, the same one that uh, Janice will be talking about. There's any number of books out there, but it gives specific details, 375 pages, on how to go plastic-free. It said that at any given time, we're never more than three feet away from something that is plastic. Plastic actually began at the turn of the centuries, around the 1920s, under Bakelite. And they made things like uh, the uh, appliances, they made radio box, the boxes that contain radio, Bakelite. It's something of a thing among uh, design people. Bakelite was Art Deco type things, but that's cellulose or wood fiber. Later on, they started using petrochemicals. Uh, nylon was the big one, and the big player on the whole business is still DuPont uh, out of Delaware. It's still the big player. Nevertheless, what are, what are we talking about with plastics? Now, everybody has seen those little labels, the triangle with the cha chasing arrows and the numbers. And I can help you out. This is a very simple thing, everyone, you need to know. The plastic drinking water bottles are number one. And given the chemical analysis for abbreviated, the acronym, it's called PET plastic, P-E-T. And those are recyclable. Number two on those things, on the bottles, if you see a number two, that's opaque plastic. Like you would see cosmetics or shampoo or laundry detergent, liquid laundry detergent. Those are number two. Three are like plastic products. Let's say perhaps a toothbrush or something like that, or a nylon uh, shower curtain would be number three. Number four is uh, the bags. And five and six, I'm not precise. Plastic six are like plastic cups and containers. And number seven 
is a category, it's a lump ball category of plastic does not fit uh, any of the other categories. So the basic, now the thing about plastic is once you make it, it's around forever. It's just like aluminum. Aluminum can be cast as cans over and over and over throughout infinity. Now, once you create plastic, the world suddenly has plastic. And short of burning it or so forth, we ain't going to get rid of it. So that's the real problem with this. Uh, so you and now the thing, the key term, you, if you want to take anything away, I want to say it's like no problem. And we'll get a little more into this. The one thing about plastic is if you want to recycle it, you have to separate the different plastics. You cannot mix up one kind, like one number ones, degrees, will not work. If for some reason, the, the chemistry of it is such that I, it's a real consuming process. Re, to recycle a water bottle, you have to clean it, sanitize it, and all, you have to leave only water bottles will be separated from all the other types of plastic. And they chop it up and put them in bales. Now that's the real problem. Now you talk about it because it's intensive. Now, that's what I mean. And when you in recycling stuff, there's all kinds of stuff in bins, cardboard, uh, all these different kinds of plastic and glass. And so that you got to separate the glass out of it. That's broken up. And cardboard recycling isn't too complex. The only thing about cardboard recycling is you can only recycle paper products once. And then you can't make, maybe make hand towels for restrooms. It, it, the fibers are get too small. So you only get to recycle it once, but that's it. Now, getting back to plastic, that's what I mean. You have, the beginning of the process is you have to separate the, the soda bottles or water bottles from all the other plastic, and then you can make those into water bottles and soda bottles again. Now, the big players on this are the soda companies. In particular, an outfit called Coca-Cola. And I think every given day, they put out like 120 billion bottles, I think. It's an enormous quantity. They have bottling installations around the world. And I believe that was the figure that is accurate. Uh, that, uh, that many. Now, what happened was and there is, in fact, a conspiracy. You guys like conspiracy theories? Here you got a good one. <laughs> the a strategy of the Coca-Cola is to say that there is nothing wrong with plastic bottles. The problem is the consumer who litters it, litters the world, doesn't put it in recycling containers. So they put the onus and they've hired people to go out and sell this message that it is you, the consumers, who are too lazy to put the bottles in recycling containers so they can be used again. It's not Coca-Cola's fault if the world gets littered with, with litter. And there's a lot of litter. The major concern about the litter issue is it floats in water. And you've got these patches around the world plastic patch, like a gigantic one in the Pacific or several. And these go on, once they get floating, they go back and forth. Amazingly enough, uh, plastic in the Pacific will go from Japan to California and back again, and they keep floating around. These guys who do nautical sailing across the oceans, sailors report that every single day 
they see nothing but containers uh, floating in in um, uh, in the ocean all over the place. Sometimes in big patches. The the other harm of the ocean plastic is that marine birds and fish, and this happens all the time, will consume that. They will eat little pieces of it. It's colorful and they're attracted to it. And they've digested all kinds of fish and animals in the islands, archipelagos, and they found their stomachs full of plastics, including plastic bags. Uh, plastic bags, by the way, please do not put those plastic bags in recycling bins in Chicago, the green bins. The reason is they clog up when they try to chop up the plastic. Those bags get wound around the knives. And you have to go and literally with a power saw and cut them off so you can continue the, the breakup process of the thing. You want to break up plastic into little modules. Um, and it's sanitized. And it looks just like little pebbles. Uh, that's a natural process. The thing that I'll have to think about the breakdown is sometimes it occurs naturally in nature. The other thing is sometimes plastic, depending on its type, will be around in, in its original configuration as a bottle for a thousand years. I mean it, a thousand years, some of these. But getting back to Coca Cola. Try to say because it appeared that the uh, people, it was the consumers who were the problem. And I will say, we also have seen that movie, it's, Tim showed it now out back, of the tearful Indian. That, see, they throw some trash at him. By the way, that's not, that guy was not an Indian, he was an Italian. But anyhow, the sweeping Indian. That was the purpose of that commercial. And they try other things. I watched on video the Coca-Cola commercials uh, that all oh, save the earth. Now, the goal of Coca-Cola, they're putting out the current propaganda, is that they will have one recycled bottle for every new bottle that they produce. Our other way of putting it is that every new bottle will be 50% a recycled bottle. It has nowhere they were going to do this by 2030. The last I checked, maybe about 12, they were about only 12% on the way to the goal of 50%. So they've fallen quite short. They got some time to go, but they're not achieving it. So they're putting a lot of things out. Now, the other, other bottling companies have gotten together as well, <laughs> and they call various things. Uh, eco uh, bottles. Now, another thing they put out there is plant-based bottles or bio, bio bottles or biodegradable bottles, which is, that's a different thing. It's plant-based ingredients, but after that, it's just like any other plastic bottle. And then biodegradable is another misleading term. That's what I mean. This is a complex topic. It's not easily understood or explained. The biodegradable. But nevertheless, we do have a problem here is that they're using petrochemicals to produce this plastic, which will never go away. And if it does break down, you get these minuscule little pieces of plastic, like grains of sand, which will be around forever. And this is a significant problem. Yeah, there's a lot of propaganda out there regarding it. Now, the book that she was talking about, the woman gives all sorts of ideas on how to go plastic free. It's not easy. I mean, yeah, we can bring a cloth bag to the grocery store and not use paper or or uh, those or a plastic bag. Certain now, the other thing is the other thing I should add. The one thing the bottle companies, in particular Coca-Cola, do not want, they do not want in any way 
they have a deposit on on plastic bottles. California has it. I don't know what you get, but I think a, a, a recycled bottle they consider is worth a penny. But California and I believe uh, Oregon, Washington have deposit laws in effect. They do not want that, and they will lob. They have lobbyists out there to prevent that from happening, and they're buying congressmen, contributing to their campaigns to avoid any sort of deposit, um, which will, will obviously because it's effective, but they feel it intrudes upon their capitalist enterprise uh, of, of things. So they're making claims. You will see commercials or advertisements or spokesperson that they're friends of the earth. So I mean, I didn't quite adequately explain. There's no such thing as a, a plant-based bottle or a biodegradable bottle. Plastic is plastic, and as far as I'll just leave it at that. Um, so that's not a solution. Don't think that's a solution by any means. Um, we do have a problem. Um, there's also some issues whether or not bottled water is in fact better than than uh, tap water. You can use some of the literature and so forth or filtered water if you wish. Filtered water perhaps if you're concerned about it. Obviously you can be at home operations, things like that. But plastics is the name of the game uh, and it's it's taking over. And it deserves to be discussed and talked about by the ecological community. I'm trying to think what else. Uh, the woman is kind of a fun book. She even goes so far as to say you can make your own ketchup and not use, therefore, you don't use a Heinz ketchup bottle. I don't know if I'm going to go that far, but she gives all sorts of ideas how to make liquid soap and things like this and not by containers. Now, that's what I mean. You've got, now, the other thing is, if I got to emphasize this, you see those triangle things that say this is recyclable. And you see a lot of plastic used in grocery stores, in particular, the fruits and vegetable department. I'm going to save you a lot of time and money. And I'll, I'll go off and say this. None of that plastic in that fruits and vegetable department is recyclable. Nobody wants it. You could turn it over and it may say on the plastic, like stick strawberries come in or the little tubs, they call it, little tubs. It may say recyclable and give a number. But that stuff is not wanted by anybody. Um, by the way, when I say that plastic has to be separated, uh, like Category 7, they, they actually use a term for it called mis, mixed, M-I-X-E-D, mixed-use plastic. And that is another problem because it'll never be recycled. There's no way to do it. It's mixed. So all the plastics are mixed together, all kinds of things like wires and cables, uh, netting, seafood, ne seafood nets. That's another problem in the ocean. These things, fish get caught in the birds in particular. But a mixed use plastic has no use whatsoever and will never be recycled in any fashion into anything at all. Uh, but the landfill. Now, they may have some application. Amazingly enough, plastic mo modules are used in, in concrete industry and paving out highways to some extent. And I've also seen a place down in, uh, in another country where they make bricks out of plastic and they don't use mortar. It's like a kid's toy, Legos. And they just connect all the bricks. They're, they've got slots. And they can put together a house. Anybody can. You don't need to mix cement or anything. You can build a nice other million houses 
out of it. But basically, mixed use plastic has no use. It goes in landfill, which also has problems because there's leachate, they call it, somehow causes problems for the water, water system like that. But you've got to watch out for greenwash by the soda companies, the Sani Water Company and things like that. They will make claims. They put 30-second commercials on with young kids holding hands and save the earth and so forth. But it's a lot of, lot of hooey there propaganda. I think that's about it. I don't want to tire you all out. It's a pretty good book. It's called Plastic Free, How I Kicked the Plastic Habit, and You Can Too, uh, by Beth Terry. I got one for 12 bucks. It's a pretty 375 pages. And she gives all sorts of biographical things of people who went plastic-free. Zero-waste heroes, she calls them. Plastic-free heroes. It's very difficult. Plastic is everywhere. Um, it's in my computer that I'm using right now. Um, but it is a hot issue, and it deserves to be there. I won't get into the issue of caps. There seems to be difference of opinion. By the way, do not do not take the caps off, at least in Chicago, from what I understand. If you recycle things, leave the caps on the bottle. That's what I mean. There are some specific issues on recycling plastics in some locations. And like a standard Coke bottle, there actually are three types of plastics, I'm told. But in Chicago, I believe the thing, and I could stand corrected, but as far as I know, you leave the bottle. But, by the way, and one of the things that they really like, if you're going to recycle anything, it's uh, those jugs, milk jugs. Apparently, there's a lot of use, versatile use. They're colorless. Um, and uh, apparently, those milk jugs are, are sought after because they're translucent as well. Uh, they have no color or, or certain types of plastic. My last thing I want to add, I don't know if you people see this commercial by that eyeglass company where they mix plastic beads and so forth. And that's what I mean. It's used everywhere. Glasses are almost entirely these days made out of plastic. The lenses and the frames. And I, I'm amazed. They don't tell you that they're, they're using beads. It's like, take it for granted. So what? It's just beads. Those classes will last a thousand years. They're going to be around. So it is a serious problem. And we can't get rid of this stuff. It floats. It's terrible to see the photos of beaches and shores and lake lakefront areas or boat marinas where it's this pile full of this plastic muck. Plastic muck that makes it worth oh, just unpleasant. Anyhow. That's about it. I think I covered everything. Uh, and I hope you know now about the pick up a copy of the book. Uh, it goes into much more detail. Um, you know, but uh, uh, it, it is uh, an issue that should be looked into. Thank you. And I hope our speaker comes as she's on her way. All this, right. We're going to, our speaker is on her way. But before we, uh, before we, uh, I'll take questions in a minute. Before we go, I just want to make a shout out because I used to work in the plastics industry. And I think that the plastics today are some of the best things we've ever done as far as getting a product, as far as making things cheaper, and as far as, uh, you know, just doing a good thing for us. Your plastic glasses do last a lot longer. Yeah, but they're not single use. And as a matter of fact, um, your car is now made out of plastic. It's about 10% 10, 10 lighter than it was in, in weight. Um, a lot of that plastic you see in the grocery store extends shelf life of uh, perishables quite a bit. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, lot of advantages to having plastics. And if you look in the medical field, simple thing like syringes. For example, um, lying tubes for operations, um, all kinds of things that are sterile and medically ready. So before you throw the baby out with the bathwater and complain about all the pollution, 
Don't forget, you got that foam insulation in homes that works really well. Styrofoam that works to help boats out and slip. Yes, we do need to get a little bit more improvement on some of the recycling techniques, but even a computer with all of its plastics in there. Your microchips involve plastic components. I mean, you know, come on, Charlie, getting rid of plastic would be like uh, tantamount to having a country that thinks it can run on renewable electricity, you know, without nuclear. I mean, said about that. What we're going to do now is take some questions and answers. And try I, to I, I want to make one announcement, Tim. Go ahead. Before we get into questions, uh, there is an informal group on that is plastic free. Uh, it's not part of any big organization like Greenpeace or Sierra. It's just some people have got together. I I go in their their conference calls once a week or every other week. So if anybody's interested, there's plastic-free informal group, and they do various little things at at street fairs and things like that. Also, I I wanted to mention that the one thing I had never really thought about is they they don't like children's balloons. That's the current thing. So if you have children's and you may give them balloons or something like that, you may be come under some criticism but uh, anyhow if anyone's interested in joining that little group they they are um every other week or so uh, i get their emails and uh it seems like to, they got their heads in the right place unlike tim who wants to use petroleum-based products to produce pollution that will never disappear from the earth i thought nuclear reactors were the best pollution but this one stand right up there with it. And if you think it's a good idea to produce some pollution that'll be around for 10,000 years, I've got to wonder about where you're thinking. All right, thank you. All right, Charlie, as you as you, you're misinformed, but never, never, nonetheless. All right, Ernie, you got the first question. Uh, Charlie. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we come on up here and ask the questions, right. if you don't mind? And that way we can I'm not certain if I can answer it, but I can well, yeah, fib we'll, it. We'll yeah, get some questions it. and we'll wait for Tim. Come on in. Go ahead. I can look. Tim, you know the difference? Yeah, Charlie, just a quick question. Uh, I couldn't write as fast as you were talking. I think I missed uh, group five and group six. Or maybe you could quickly go through all seven of those groups. Oh, five and six are. And then maybe you could give us the website for that plastic group you were just talking about. Five, five is plastic cups like people have at picnics. Those red cups, it's, it's like breakable plastic. Five are, are, as far as I know, those plastic cups you see all over the place are Christmas parties. Things like that. They sell them in long stacks. And six are plastic containers that are also breakable type uh, glass like attributes. That's as far as I know. Um, so five and six are also containers, but they have a breakable quality about them. As opposed to like water bottles, you squeeze it, it just Goes flat, nothing happens. But it's a sterner kind of plastic. Let's put it that way: a stronger kind of plastic, uh, as far as I know. But as as in the sense, also with the strength comes the breakability. So that's what I mean. Those those are plastic cups. Uh, like if you buy plastic cups, uh, use them at home or something like that. Those would be five. And six would be certain types of containers, maybe like pharmaceutical or, or healthcare products, something like that. What about plastic silverware and plastic tools? Yeah, plastic I don't know. I can't remember. All right, Jake, you had a question. Go ahead. Jake at 2925 on mute and ask your question. Jake, ask your question. You're on. You got to unmute. 
Jake. All right, who else has got a question? All right, who else has a question? I, I, I asked about the website. All right, Charlie, what's the website? For that, for that plastic group. For the plastic group. Yeah. Uh, I, they don't have a website. That's what I mean. It's an informal group. But let me read the five codes again. PET is the most common one. Number one. Those are bottles for soda, water, and juice and other drinks. Jars for peanut butter, for example. Microwavable containers. Polyester fabric. Pet bottles are recyclable. Uh, and that's all it's recycled in the carpets. Number two uh, is milk and water jugs, bottles for shampoo, laundry detergent, household cleaners. That's what I mean. Number two are opaque bottles. Number three are pipes, vinyl chloride, PVC piping is the most common form. Uh, that's what I mean. It's used for products. Um, Tubing, wire, cables, uh, things like that. It's it's stuff, items. Number four, uh, uh, what is it? Those, that's the bags. That's the garbage bags, all of those type of things. Okay, that's four. Number five is uh, certain type of containers. As I said, uh, this is where bottle caps are. That's what I mean. They cause problems. Because the bottles will be number one and the caps will be five. Um, so it causes problems with five. Um, yeah. The stiffer kind of plastic, a breakable plastic, as I said. Six uh, is opaque. Uh, those are the clamshells that you see in grocery stores. And you take out things like that. Foodware such as plastic drinks, cups, and utensils are number six. That's right. Number six, if you get takeout food, um, it's number six. Utensils. Uh, styrofoam yeah. is a number six. Uh, packaging for electronics and furniture. But that's disposable foodware. Is number six and seven is everything else five gallon jugs, baby bottles, DVDs, CDs, food processors, appliances, eyeglass lenses, and other products. So that company is actually showing a commercial advertising their plastic eyeglasses, which is going to be around as a form of pollution for a thousand years. Boy, that's a good idea. That's what I mean. They don't care. All right, what else? Did that All right, Jake, go ahead. Jake, you got your hand raised. 293, 2915, you're on. Go ahead. You got your hand raised, Jake. You want to ask a question? Go ahead. You're on. Well, he's got his hand raised. All right, who else? That's what I'm going to. Anyway, anyway, Jake, are you there? Whoever's on the phone, you're on. Oh, hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's you, Jake. Yeah. Okay. Um, question. Um, what was my question? Is there a um, biodegradable form of plastic, number one? Um, number two, um, if plastics get into a lake or an ocean, how do they get there? Do they walk over and, and jump in, or do they do they, they uh, uh, fly over uh, via uh, artificial intelligence or a GPS system? How do they do it? Is this a leading question? And answer the question, Charlie. Hello. Yeah, we can. It's a leading out. question. That's, you, you, you fall right into Coca Cola Steven. would like to. Plus, you're gonna blame, you're gonna blame the consumer, right? Let's blame the consumer instead of Coca-Cola, who made the pollution, who made it, who who created it, you know, that it's our problem, right? Coca-Cola gets off scot-free, creates pollution, 
and then it's your our problem. I agree with you. It's our problem then, you know. Now, we, from what I understand, there is no the, the bio plant stuff is, as I said, is is um, uh, um, it is not true. There, if you think that you just use some biogradable thing, it's regular plastic. From what I've read, it's not different than any other plastic uh, after it's put together, and it doesn't degrade in real nice little things. Uh, there's a lot of chemistry involved here, but in my understanding is that is not a solution if that's what you think, that we just use that as the raw material. Um, I even rem I even looked this up before we came here. Uh, I know what page it's on. Um, let me see if I can find it. Hopefully, I could read to you. Um, uh, let's see. But I didn't get the idea that uh, that is the solution, and all we have to do is change the raw material to the basic ingredients, um, and that everything will be fine and it'll just break down in the environment um that was not my impression and it's not given much traffic um all right who else has a question let's, let's go ahead russ up front all right all right. All right. Let's no, 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 Russ. Let's go up to the up to the mic. Let's let's hear. It. Okay. Yes. All right, so Russ. All right, Charlie. You're gonna get a half the problem could be re re resolved just going back to the old returnable. Half of these problems will be reduced by just going back to the old returnable. We used to get our Cokes and Pepsis in returnable bottles. And of course, the beer used to all be in returnable bottles. That was pretty good because they're monthly, they were all standardized. We still can get milk in a returnable bottle. It's called Overwhite. Okay. Uh, our... All right, let me explain. Bio bio based plastic. There's bio based plastic and there's biodegradable plastic. And bio based plastic are containers made from corn, sugar, bamboo, or other natural fibers. And are these better than plastic, regular plastic? It says it depends. Um but there's a difference between bio-based and biodegradable products. That's what I mean. This gets confusing. So you can have things made from corn, wheat, potatoes, sugar cane, even non-food products. Um, they may not be biodegradable. Biodegradable refers to what happens to products at the end of their lives. Uh, truly biogradable depth of products can be completely broken down by microorganism in the disposal environment. Uh, Bio-based plastics in general have a lower carbon footprint than fossil-based plastics. So, okay, Charlie, our, our speaker has shown up tonight. Um, I'm going to require a reboot on my computer real quick to get the uh, thing going, so... I'm going to temporarily transfer controls of the host over to you, and then I'll be logging right in shortly, okay? So do I get a free dinner at the college? Charlie, you can, if you get here, I'll buy you a dinner. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, Charlie, we're going to go down, and I'm going to transfer host to you right now. And then what you're going to do is you're going to do a quick restart. And uh, sorry about this. I am getting a new laptop very soon. So uh, I'm going to transfer the host to you real quick. Um, 
And we're gonna we're just gonna do a quick reboot here. Sorry about this, but we have only a, a two hour time frame on this particular browser, but we'll do it. All right, just give me a few minutes, Charlie. We'll be right back, okay? Sure. So what do you guys think about all this? Hi, Margaret. Hello, Charles. You know, I think all of these ideas are very noble, and I'm inter interested in hearing what Janice has to say. And I was just with my niece in Austin, and she follows a lot of this. It's simply that it's very difficult for most of us to do it. Now, we can do some things, but, you know, for me personally, if I were getting uh, bottles on which there was a deposit and had to carry them back, and I'm using a lift, just impossible. However, there are a lot of little things people can do. And one of the things, we had a program on this. I don't know if it was on college. And clothing is fairly low on the environment, the negative environmental effect. But it suggests that you buy used clothing because it has been, you know, laundered. It's been to the dry cleaner, blah, blah, blah. That does cut down on pollution. But probably our biggest problem is fossil fuels, you know, our automobiles, most of our automobiles. And I'm also wondering about refrigerated air conditioning because um, I live in a high rise and ours is water chilled, which has its advantages and disadvantages. But refrigerated air conditioning in Texas is a necessity if you want to do business. I mean, they're so, it is yeah. so complex. I'm eager to see what Janice is going to add to this because Charlie, you covered so much. The uh, I used I used to get, when I was in the used book business I spent one every week on half price day I went to the resale shops to find locate books and I'd pick up coats and shirts and yeah take them to the lobby uh, get some starch and uh, boy I had nicest shirts you could believe you know oh, a lot yes. of times they were brand new I so got easy. my coat my winter coat. I still think there was a little something wrong with the zipper, but mm -hmm. on half price day, I was fifteen dollars. You know, about sure. a two or three hundred dollar coat. Definitely. You know. I mean, I love to go to those kinds of shops. I belong to a du whole dual memberships at Catholic Church and Unitarian, and First Unitarian does this closing counters every year around February. Everything is donated, and we ask only for a donation, uh, and we. We raised two and we raised twenty thousand dollars in three days. You know, there's a mark, and then whatever oh, we wow. had left went to a clothing, a used clothing place that uh, Family Gateway, which is one of our best charities, they take families who have no place to live. They can go over there and shop with a certain amount of credit for, for us. But I loved love finding used clothes, Charles. <laughs> and if you don't like it, you can well, always give it to somebody else. Mentioning. She mentioned mm -hmm. bags. I used to always pick up bags. Matter of fact, I have a stack about two foot high from the resale shop, all sorts of uh, book bags and stuff like oh, that. Oh, yes. And I use that when I go grocery shopping. I always have several of them. And uh, old book bags I used to use when I drove a bookmobile. And I know. You were, just, uh, you were a librarian, correct? <laughs> Yeah, I, for the Chicago public, can, for Chicago public. Right. I, you know, I that's a story I never did. I ran, I sold their used books. And I, matter of fact, I even passed the test the second to be a, a chief librarian. Mm -hmm. I got an A in the test, but I got a job with the federal government as a librarian. Okay, good. And, and I also, I won't get into jobs. It also, I worked with photography and cameras oh. in the government, microfilm. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. It's my hobby and is photography and they call it reprographic. So I took a job like that and and never left there. You know, was, I became a union official then, you know. 
Right. But no, I I never went back to public librarian. I've been a school librarian and a public librarian. So. And which did you prefer? Several they're places. very different. But which did you yeah, prefer? Yeah, they're all different. Yeah. They're you all know, different. There, there's a bunch of layoffs here in Texas now of school librarians. We're having a terrible time here with uh, the ultra conservative trying to do everything they can to destroy the public school system. You know, they want vouchers. Um, they do not want to allot the necessary funds for uh, school teachers, librarians, and they're laying off a lot of librarians. It's just another form of censorship. We well, had that's, that's what, how I got started. I was going to graduate school, University of Illinois, and I was doing substitute teaching to make money, and I got assigned as a school librarian. Uh -huh. I said, "Wow, this is pretty cool." And I then I switched from graduate from my other school and went to library school for graduate. So right. well, I was a school librarian. It was so nice, different. There are there's four different types. There's school, public, special library, Special. and uh, academic. And I was three of the four. You know, uh, uh, Charlie, I worked for Dallas Public from 1960 to 1981. I just loved it. Oh, wow. I mean, uh, and I'm not a librarian. Yeah, I was the director's administrative assistant, basically. But it was fascinating. And, of course, I love the fact that we had some real interesting characters using the public library. We even had armed guards sure. then. We even had armed guards back then. Uh, now, I, I know they have security. We have a relatively new building, 40 years old, but it's new to us. And it's fabulous. But uh, and, and but today, you don't need that much space because things are digitized. But it's a fascinating, yeah. and I have a fabulous little neighborhood library, Oak Lawn. I live in the Gaberhood, Charles, as I call it. And they have all sorts of LGBTQ uh, programs and books. And it's just a fascinating little public neighborhood library. They're wonderful. Has Janice yeah, they are. here? Where is Janice? Is she ready to talk? Has I Janice come? Yet. Apparently she and, arrived, I think. I thought she'd gotten here. I can't believe where she got, ended up getting lost. It was, was incredible. She, was she driving? It wasn't, yeah, it, it wasn't anywhere near where she was supposed I, to be. I, I, I was amazed. I said, how in the world did you get there? She was in some suburb. I go, and, and we meet in the city. And I'm going, what are you doing out there? <laughs> Unbelievable. She must have been highly. That's really getting lost, you know. Well, I she'll said, have a what? lot. To, she'll have a lot to tell us. I didn't even believe when she told me where she was. I go because I know where she she lives, not terribly far from me. And I go, what are you doing over there? Well, you know, I don't own a car any longer, so I take Lyft, and a lot of times you still have to lug stuff around, just like you're on a subway. You know, you take a lot of stuff with you that you're going to need in route. And that's a little inconvenient, but I think, honestly, it's so much less stressful for somebody else to be finding the place. So Janice should have used a lift. Yeah. <laughs> well. How close is the restaurant? How close is the restaurant to where she lives? How far is this restaurant? It's not really? close. It's pretty no. far. It's... And, and she, I See? guess she got she drives at night. Well, let's put it this way. We're 40 blocks north, and she lives 95 blocks south. So, Oh, my gosh. It's, 100, it's quite a ways. It certainly is. Um, the, uh, um, but it is, yeah, she's, she comes quite, quite a distance. Uh, but she could take public transit, which makes it very easy by the way as well you know and you all have a good it's, system there uh, and we oh have, yeah we have a bad system it's yeah. not bad it's simply not used all okay. right we're back, Tim's back on. That. we're now back and we're sorry about that okay janice if you want to go up 
behind the microphone. We'll uh, get you started. And uh, you get your present. when you're ready for your presentation, let me know. Well, I know this is aggravating. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you. well we're going to let you go. Uh, thank you for coming, Janice. Uh, it started. Uh, the reason I came is because I keep the camera uh, locked on my computer on account I was defrauded five years ago. And so I, uh, I, you know, my I wouldn't have been seen. And that's why I decided to come up here. And that was really a mistake. <laughs> to stay home. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, Charlie's Charlie's gone over a lot of it already. So Charlie was doing a presentation before we came out. Seven different types. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Just go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. I'm Janice Ginsler. Uh, I'm the recycle person from my uh, um, church that's in Hazelcrest, um, which is seven hundred and seventy south, and. Um, Okay, uh, the uh, February issue of Consumer Reports uh, is about how to avoid eating plastic. Uh, the reason is, you know that plastic is everywhere. It's even in farm fields. <laughs> and <laughs> the um, uh, plastic biodegrade, it doesn't biodegrade, it degrades and, into little bits. And it goes into the earth and roots take it up. Uh, so basically what the article says is, you know, eat organically, I think is what the article says, if I re uh, recall correctly. And the book that I got most of my information from is Plastic Free. Does anybody remember Jerome McDonald, who was on WBEZ, uh, the public radio station, he interviewed Beth Terry, and I was listening, and I got the book, but that was 10 years ago. <laughs> so the book is 10 years old. Um, uh, so some of the things aren't, aren't uh, you know, up to date, so I used other sources. And by the way, today on uh, Science Friday, that's on WBEZ, they had an episode on plastic. Uh, I was kind of running around, so I don't recall exactly what was in it because it was on yesterday and, you know, I don't have a bit of memory to remember what it was about. But um, uh, also, Terry Gross, that's on WBEZ, uh, interviewed Eric Schlosser, who uh, made the Food Nation uh uh, film documentary uh, uh, maybe nine years ago uh, and he's making Food Nation 2 now or he's made it and I, it might be in theaters now uh, and uh, when I downloaded the um, text from that interview which is 10 pages long <laughs> uh, all the words uh, I saw that near the end he talked about how grocery stores and uh, the food industry uh, has bought Congress. Of course, we know corporations have bought Congress because they're stronger, they have more money than Congress. And he also mentioned that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, has the same number of employees as it did in 1978, because just like the uh, IRS and other agencies of the government that at the Postal Service that the uh, Congress has uh, defunded, uh, uh, the FDA has been defunded too, um, because certain members of Congress want to privatize the entire government. <laughs> so they defund it. <laughs> and that's because we're too silent. Does anybody who's here or online ever contact uh, the powers that be in Washington, D.C., like the president and Congress and agencies like the EPA? Thank you. I see one hand. Thank you. Let's all do that. 
I talk to the president oh, every other day. Your state representative, mine is Sean Caston, uh, and our senators, Duckworth and Durbin. Uh, Duckworth was in the military. She lost, you know, like maybe three of her, uh, you know, hand, feet, uh, and she's in a wheelchair now. Uh, uh, to the uh, to the military, but she still is in love with the military. Uh, so <laughs> it's hard to get her to stop funding war. <laughs> she is a warmonger. Uh, but uh, Senator Durbin uh, has called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, at least he's done that. But he still voted for. Uh, you know, in Congress, they put all these fundings for all these wars into one bill. So if you want funding for Ukraine, you got to vote for funding for Israel and Taiwan. Um, so war is the mantra of Congress. War, 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 war. So our voices are very needed because we don't want to be eternally at war because it denies social services. <laughs> okay, so I don't know what's on the screen. Oh, you. Okay, well, why don't you get the presentation up so that I can see it. <laughs> That's all right, we'll, we'll flip it when you're ready. Janice, if you want to come out and come out front, that's fine. Just grab, I'll grab, I'll have you hold the mic. Just, uh, just, uh, what, just, 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 just get behind there and get your presentation up. No, I, I'll, no, I'll, I'll, I'll hand hold it for you. Just let me get the presentation up and I'll, give me a minute, please. Well, yeah, yeah. We'll see in a minute. Give me a minute and I'll get you up and ready to go. go okay, so, uh, uh, hang on. on webinar from College of Complexes, to, uh, I mentioned about this book, uh, Plastic Free, How I Pick the Plastic Habit and So Can You, um, uh, by Beth Terry. And she, she saw a baby, she was in um, Oakland, California, and she's an accountant. And uh, 10 years ago when the book was written, she saw a baby albatross on the internet uh, the Pacific Ocean uh, that had uh, died. It was a chick. Uh, and it had decomposed so much you could see what was in its stomach. And I don't know if I could open the book to the right page. Um, I could see that. Uh, I mean, it had a toothbrush in it. It had a, a lighter in it. In, in, in its stomach, it had what was in the ocean fed to it. And our use of plastic does that. It kills wildlife, uh, whales, beach because they're full of plastic. Uh, so we all got to stop with the plastic. Stop, stop, stop as much as you can. Okay. Um, you could go to the next one. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, she's an accountant and she was recovering. Okay, the baby albatross, oh, had cigarette butts, bottle tops, cigarette lighters, a toothbrush, and, and other types of plastic in its stomach. Uh, we'd likely die if we had that in our stomach too. <laughs> Next. Okay, so what she did is she created, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, a, an Excel file where she listed all the plastic in her house. She pulled it all out of wherever she had it and listed it all. What was recyclable and what was not. Um, okay. Um, and she, little by little, we could do this, little by little, got rid of all that plastic. Of course, I've tried to do that. And I have ceramic bowls and plates and everything. But then, of course, they break because they're glass, they're ceramic. <laughs> so you got to new ones. So, so that's the way life used to be. I guess she probably already, you know, some of you might remember that. Okay, the ocean. Um, uh, does anybody, uh, the, the One Earth Film Festival just ended um, last weekend. Uh, and at the One Earth Film Festival, uh, I, 
uh, saw a film called Cowspiracy. And it was about a man who had been on Oprah Winfrey's uh, program um, uh, uh, when they talked about beef. And he talked about, you know, how bad that is. And so he was sued, but Oprah Winfrey was behind him. So they won the lawsuit. <laughs> so, but um, um, anyways, the reason I bring that up is there were two talking heads in that film. And one was uh, Richard Oppenlander, who's way at the bottom. Uh, he's a, a PhD. Um, and he wrote the book, uh, Comfortably Unaware, What We Choose to Eat is Killing Us and the Planet by Richard A. Oppenlander. Um, so we also know that uh, from his book, uh, chapter three is about oceans. And um, because of climate change, which we have caused uh, <laughs> by using plastic, um, the uh, fish that used to be in you know, along the North uh, Atlantic uh, in the United States has gone north to Canada where it's cooler. And I mean, the krill has gone there. So the fish have gone there too. Um, so what do, what do fisher, uh, fisher people do? They take trawlers that go along the bottom of the ocean and ruin the ocean floor. <laughs> so you can eat fish. You know, a lot of people say, I'm not gonna eat uh, beef, I'm going to eat fish and chicken. But here's here's the word that fish is overfished. <laughs> and uh, we're in the ocean by eating fish. Uh, uh, capos, do uh, you know what a capo is? A concentrated animal feeding operation. That's where all the animals are, in capos. Uh, and by the way, the Farm Bill uh, put, gives a lot of money to those CAFOs, uh, and it shouldn't. So that's why we have to contact Congress regarding the Farm Bill. Uh, do not fund CAFOs. They ruin the earth. They ruin the groundwater. Okay, regarding chicken. There's a chicken CAFO on Chesapeake Bay. And when you get you know, half a million chickens in one location, uh, they have feces and it gets put into Chesapeake Bay. So, <laughs> so, um, so chicken is not good either. What's good is uh, refusing an to eat animals and, you know, become a vegetarian or a vegan. I'm a vegan. Uh, and um, I watched WTTW in 12 or 14 years ago in 2010. They had Dr. Joel Furman on, F-U-H-R-M-A-N. And uh, he wrote the book, Eat to Live, instead of Live to Eat, you know? <laughs> uh, eat to, uh, okay. So um, it, uh, by Googling him, uh, Joel, J-O-E-L, Furman, F-U-H-R-M-A-N. Um, you can get onto his website. And when I got on, it was $3.50 a month. Now I think it's $7 or something like that a month because uh, we're 14 years later. <laughs> you know, we had inflation. Uh, so at any rate, um, they used to, and they might, if you're new, uh, send you a uh, a meal a day, you know, a recipe a day. Um, uh, but on the website, you can look in your refrigerator and see what kind of stuff you got. And then you can go to the website and enter, say, avocado or, um, you know, some vegetable or fruit or something. And uh, recipes with that ingredient will come up. Um, and you can have a dish that's full of color. For example, uh, who was it? Former President Bill Clinton. He had heart disease. And so he became a vegan. <laughs> and he sent out recipes. And I know a long time ago, I got a couple of his recipes. And one is for um, putting in a little 
uh, you can water saute or you can put it in a little bit of oil. Um, uh, onion, garlic, um, uh, a fourth cup of, of red uh, bell pepper and a fourth cup of green bell pepper. And, you know, cook those for five minutes till they become soft and stuff. And then you put in, oh, I guess that's when you put the, the garlic in. And you put a tablespoon of um, vinegar in there, uh, white, white something. <laughs> what kind of vinegar? But anyway, you think of it, vinegar, uh, white wine oil uh, or vinegar. Uh, and uh, then you, uh, uh, and you let the uh, garlic be there for a minute. And then you put the uh, a can of white beans, like um, Great Northern or canola or something like that in. Um, and cook that for, I don't know, something green on top. And whatever green you have, you know, parsley or uh, cilantro or something like that on it. It's a beautifully colorful dish. Unlike if you order meat, everything is earth colored, you know? <laughs> so, um, so do you want colorful meals or do you want earth tone meals? Uh, you know, that, that might kill you before your time, you know? <laughs> okay. Uh, chicken pullets because they're have thousands of time in cages, one on top of the other, so the pieces go down on top of them. Uh, and they release the, their feces into the Chesapeake Bay fish. Oh, yeah, when I was right out of college, I um, uh, had studied uh, German and Russian, and uh, I went to. Oh. <laughs> I went to Europe, like, oh, Yugoslavia, <laughs> and um, on the Adriatic coast. And uh, this was in May, and I was traveling south on the Adriatic coast, and I stopped at a place that was just opening for the season. And the host of that, the owner of that, uh, asked me to dinner, and he caught a fish, and we ate that fish. And I thought it was chicken. <laughs> It was so fresh. It wasn't like you know, chicken, uh, you know, fingers or you know, uh, fi you know, fish sticks or anything like that. It was uh, fresh caught. Um, uh, it was fresh caught, <laughs> and so it's, it's it tasted nothing like the fish I had eaten at home. That was you know, breaded and stuff like that. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So Beth Perry's. Um, started as a blog, and it eventually became the book, Plastic Free, How I Keep the Plastic Habit and So Can You. I, I learned about Miss Perry, as I said before, on NPR, National Public Radio, uh, when Jerome McDonald, um, maybe, it. was it McDonald or McDonnell? John Jerome McDonald. McDo yeah, McDonnell. It should be oh, N-E-L, not Donald. But anyways, interviewed her in 2012. Her blog blog became a book. Uh, okay, so uh, the book starts with what is plastic? Plastic is a polymer, but not all polymers are plastic. <laughs> Natural polymers are the building blocks of life. <laughs> uh, starches, finger and toenails, proteins and DNA are polymers. Air is a polymer. All of the above biodegrade and return to Earth. <laughs> In 1855, they made something that behaved like plastic. <laughs> Uh, but uh, clear, um, they're plastic paper bags and wrappers. Yeah, which is, I think, 
biodegradable. Clear plastic tape, bags and wrappers, many other items created too from cellulose. So cellulose, I think biodegrades. All these device products were biodegradable. Uh, but, uh, okay, so when plastics were created, um, they put carbon with hydrogen uh, from fossil sources, <laughs> and that's, and crude oil, and that's when uh, polymers and plastic became bad. These uh, are used in cosmetics, and it was about the cosmetics, cosmetics industry. And I read that the cosmetics industry um, regulates itself. Government does not. <laughs> so cosmetics, soaps, detergents, pesticides, and more are made from fossil fuels. Well, my, my well, maybe they are. Maybe they are. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, okay, methane. <laughs> Plastics can be toxic, not like cellulose. Uh, methane is far worse for climate change than carbon because it stays in the atmosphere a lot longer. It's like 80% worse than carbon. And all those animals that we like to eat, they breathe out methane. <laughs> the thousands of lambs and cats cows out there, they put methane into the atmosphere. Uh, okay, so carbon in the atmosphere, uh, which uh, the NOAA, uh, I can't remember what it stands for. National Oceanic. Uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric. Thank you, National Oceanic an atmospheric administration. An atmospheric administration. Thank you. Uh, um, carbon in the atmosphere is at 420 parts per million. But is anybody a member of 350.org that comes out of Vermont? We've had him uh, speak here before. We've had him speak here before. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that's great. <laughs> and um, so, 350.org tells us that uh, 350 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere is all that Earth can tolerate. But we're at 420 parts per million now. And by the way, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, thank you. <laughs> Bureau of Land Management uh, is considering whether to approve oil leases right now. And Biden gave the okay maybe six months ago for oil, more oil leases. So no. that's why it's very important to contact the White House. Uh, you can go to whitehouse.gov, G-O-V, uh, slash contact to contact the White House and, you know, Biden, which I do almost every day. <laughs> Um, and say no, uh, renewable. And does anybody read the Tribune? Because um, uh, last this uh, April twenty first, in the Tribune on the first page below the midpoint, uh, was an article about PJM Interconnection LLC. And that's an agency that takes renewable fuel and puts it on the grid. The only trouble is PJM Interconnections is behind uh, 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 renewable fuels that were created in 2019 haven't been put on the grid yet. We could probably be at 100% renewables if PJM worked a little bit faster. So, so write that down. P J M Interconnections is the agency that puts renewable fuel onto the grid, and it's not working. And we need more than one agency that does that. Yes. 
Yes. And there's lots of renewable energy out there, but it hasn't been put on the... Uh, actually, I, I emailed CJM Interconnections and they sent me, I don't know, a five or ten page response. I don't know what they said. They said that we're working on it. I guess that's what they said. <laughs> okay, carbon versus nothing. Um, yeah, let's, let's go to the next one. Okay. Oh, you want to go, go back? I have a feeling. Oh, damn it. Hang on. Hang on. One more. I know. I got to get. Oh. Right there. There it is. What you just talking about? Oh, methane stays. methane stays here longer than any other gas. Oh, yeah, methane stays longer in the atmosphere. Okay. Okay. All right. Benzene, or do you want that? Okay. okay, benzene. Uh, <laughs> in lunch 2020, I listened to a webinar from the United Methodist Women. I don't remember. Uh, it's now United Women in Faith. Uh, uh, and we have an equal justice uh, section. And they presented a, uh, a webinar on Cancer Alley. Has anybody ever heard of Cancer Alley? No. <laughs> yes. Cancer Alley uh, is all along the southern border of, uh, in this case, Louisiana. And racist zoning board, uh, boards in Louisiana say, let's look for a poor community of color and call it industrial. And so what happens? The refineries move in, like a hundred of them, more than a hundred of them. Uh, <laughs> so when we, uh, you know, fill up our gas tanks, uh, you know, we're giving people leukemia, actually, that live in poor communities of Louisiana. So uh, that's in St. Joseph, Louisiana, and we heard people from St. Joseph, people who are very active in trying to close those refineries, but our voices are needed too. Because we need 100% renewables, not all these leases of oil. Say that again. <laughs> Well, oh let's God. see about that because if cars can run on electricity, they can, but they, they, they in China it's happening. happening. Uh, in China it's happening. Well, I think I that technology is always China. moving in the right direction. <laughs> I, I hope. China All right, Mike, let us. I stay. haven't flown in years, years and years. <laughs> I take the train instead. <laughs> All right, Janice, if we can. Um... Okay, once um, St. Joseph Parish, Louisiana became industrial, 122 companies that threw benzene into the air arrived, most were refineries. The U.S. National Toxicology Program, the NPT, <laughs> is a program that includes the National Institutes of Health. You know, I'm about to be out of that. Uh, and the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, the Amer American Cancer Society is written about benzene. Uh, and uh, yeah, that you get leukemia from uh, benzene. Uh, most studies in people have not found an increased risk of cancers other than leukemia among those with higher exposures. Benzene has been shown to, grow, to cause chromosome changes in bone marrow. Yikes. Okay. The bone marrow is where new blood cells are made. <laughs> so you don't want that area, you know, to be benzene, full of benzene. Uh, such changes are commonly found in human leukemia cells. <laughs> Exposure to benzene has been linked to with a higher risk of cancer. 
particularly leukemia and other causes, uh, cancers of blood cells. <laughs> okay. Um, Janice, why don't we uh, start uh, wrapping it up so we can get some rebuttal time in here. Oh, all right. I'll move, I'll move, I'll move um, okay, um, let's just go to the next where benzene comes from. Um, you can <coughs> Okay, the very spikes of. We, we, we covered these, we covered all this already. Right. And then your slow show. So just go ahead and wrap it up and we'll okay. um, uh, I wanted just at the end to talk about uh, <coughs> paper or plastic. I think she's got some up here. Um, uh, when you make paper bags, you use a gallon of water to create those, whereas plastic uses one one thousandth uh, of a gallon of water to create a plastic bag. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense to use paper bags. It makes sense to use cloth or reusable bags. So for your birthday, for every holiday, tell your relatives that you want to uh, save the earth and not use plastic bags or anything plastic. Um, and you want reusable bags. And they will give you plastic bags. My niece, oh, I didn't, it's in my car that my niece uh, a dozen years ago gave me uh, a canvas bag and on it it says canvas uh, because plastic is so last year <laughs> and i've had that for 12 years it holds a whole lot of stuff <laughs> oh that's good and but you got to clean those if you have reusable bags you got to clean them <laughs> otherwise you know you can get stuff on them <laughs> okay All okay right. um yeah, uh, that's if, if that's it, what we're going to do then is do you want to take a couple questions real quick or or Mike, you got a question? Yeah, obviously, the biggest problem is single use uh, bottle plastic bottles for water and for soda drinks and for any kind of single alcohol. What's your name? It's Mike. Mike, you're absolutely right. It's obviously the biggest plastic problem. It is. It is. And oh, oh, but, yeah, and by the way, uh, and there's chemicals in plastic bottles, yeah, phthalates, <laughs> yes, huh? phthalates. There's all kinds of chemicals in plastic bottles, Thank, and, and, and it's a trade secret what chemicals they put into exactly. those. Exactly, so it's very unhealthy. Okay, so, what do we do? We got to go back to plastic and convertible glass bottles. Well, I have a glass water bottle that is coated in silicone. And silicone is okay. So you can get it from life back yeah, to that we got, stores, we got jewels that'll have one one line of groceries, like one uh, whole section is all bottled drinks and plastic. If you, you go to Target, you'll find one section of all plastic bottles. Get people walking out of jewels. Like, yeah, I and I have called Jewel uh, numerous times, and I think they outsource that. You know that when you call, what's on the receipt? Uh, I don't think it ever goes to Jewel. All right. Okay, Why do we have recycling in the first place? Plastics. Because of oil. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The plastic industry cycles is lies. <laughs> In 
decent. Uh, no, uh, try try to avoid wearing those because whatever chemicals are in those clothing will come onto your skin. <laughs> uh, not good. I know I used to have okay. polyester clothing. I don't wear that anymore. <laughs> okay, Jake, you got your hand up. You got a question. Jake? Jake, your hands up. You want to ask a question or not? Okay, turn off the All right. Who else has got a question? Charlie? Oh, fuck. He's an idiot. All right, Charlie, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, Janice, only 2%, maybe 15 to 2% of the methane in the atmosphere is produced by livestock, cattle. That doesn't sound like it, it, it's a big deal. Uh, I don't think people understand that. A big deal? They don't produce, they, they produce methane, but so very little of it, it's de minimis. So, so when, you, when you have thousands of animals in one location and their feces go into the, go into groundwater, it's not a problem? It, that's, listen. It's it's you guys are not being accurate. Cat all the cattle on earth produce very, very, very little methane. So stopping eating meat is not gonna have any effect, a really significant effect at all on stopping global warming. Methane is agreeable. I agree with you, it's a dangerous gas. It lasts about ten years versus CO two, which could be gone. Virtually in, in no time, but stopping the to think that you're going to stop global warming by not eating meat is invalid. All right, I, I didn't hear everything, but I, I got the point that uh, Charles wants to keep uh, eating um, a beef, um, and uh, beef. Uh, so, you know, when there's thousands of animals, uh, you know, putting methane into the atmosphere and they're sick because they've eaten grass for the last thousand years, but they're fed corn and soybeans now, uh, and they're sick going up to slaughter and they have to be forced into the slaughter. Um, ah. I mean, if you saw your animals uh, as they uh, were raised and go to slaughter, I think it would turn your stomach. Okay. Wait a minute. Are you telling me a feeder lot? My best friend owned a feeder lot. What kind of thing are you talking about? That feeding a cow corn is bad for a cow? Are you for real? I think that's How does that make it sick? How does it make it cow sick? It's been running for the corn. What it, doesn't make, it doesn't harm the cow. He said that corn that corn does not hurt cows. He goes, "Are you nuts? Does corn hurt cows?" Uh, well, you know, I'm not a cow, so I can't really answer that. But um, cows ate grass for thousands of years before humans put them into feedlots. They never ate corn before we started feeding it to them. Okay. All right, if there's no more questions, um, we're gonna go into an abbreviated rebuttal period. Who's that, Mike? It's Mike. If anybody wants to speak now, speak now. Charlie, you wanna go first? We got about maybe 20 minutes to do our rebuttals. Nobody's gonna speak online. Yeah, I'll go, I guess. I wasn't prepared. All right, Rob. 
Jake, you want to say something? We got a hand over here. All right. Why don't you go on up into the front and we'll go over rebuttals. But I'll allow about everybody about three to five minutes. Then it's and we'll get the last word. Okay. <laughs> we'll get the last word. I'm gonna put the mic back. Put the mic back. Ready. I just see some of this problem with all this plastic would have been a bit reduced if we would have kept using the returnable bottles. It's not only you hardly even needed to recycle, but you just wash those out. It would have been at least a little less. Overwise seems to be doing a pretty good job with it. Okay, who else has got a rebuttal? All right, go ahead. Well, yeah, you've you got a chance. Take up to five minutes if you need to. Um, My name is Joe Kopsik. I'm not, not an expert on recycling, but I'm trying to become the uh, chapter. Uh, um, head of the Lake County Green Party chapter, which does not exist, exist yet. So it will be my responsibility to inform myself about this topic. And I want to let you guys know uh, what I do know about the topic. One, I want to talk about the uh, pros and cons of plastic versus glass uh, in terms of biodegradability. Um, plastic takes a thousand years to biodegrade, and glass has its advantages, but it does take 4,000 to 5,000 years to biodegrade. Um, and I'm sure there's different kinds of plastics, you know, seven times or more, they probably different, uh, different lengths of time. And Russell was talking about the benefits of glass and, you know, there's, like I said, there's pros and cons. There's a, it's, um, it's an optimization game. There is no true, you know, universally preferred outcome. So here's how standardization could benefit us. Like, I like the idea of returning glass bottles and we need to bring that back, but in a different form. Um, Charlie was talking about the problem of uh, like people who put their recyclables in trash bags and in, into the recycling bin. Um, he said, uh, if you chop those all up, um, you, know, you don't want the bags in there. But that's assuming that all the recyclables are the same kind. Like, I don't know about how recycling plans work. I need to inform myself on that topic. But here's my idea um, how standardization could help us. If the trash bags and the recyclables could all be made out of the same materials, then you could shred them all up and it would be at the same time. If you, don't, if you don't do that, then you have to teach people how to sort seven different types of recyclables. And I don't know, maybe the types of the most common could be available. And like, when I was a kid, I saw this movie um, that had uh, four, it was like a container with four different bags in one for different types of recyclables. You know, there's also composting. So you have to have a pretty sophisticated uh, system if you want to recycle a lot of different things. Otherwise, you could make some stuff out of, you know, less diverse types of chemicals to make it easier to recycle those recyclables. Um, I also wanted to end by just telling you guys about two documentaries. Uh, one presents kind of a problem. Um, there's a group of Coptic Christians in Cairo, Egypt, called the Zabalim, and they scrounge all the garbage of the whole city of um, 25 million people as much as they can, and they recycle as much of it as they can. And they, there's a documentary called Garbage Dreams about them. And this one kid, or 20 year old kid, he takes a job at a Western recycling plant and he finds that he's only allowed to recycle 20% of the material. Whereas the people who scrounge for garbage on the streets of Cairo, they are able to, to find new uses for 80% of the material. So, and this is like a 10 or 15 year old documentary. So, I'm not saying this is the most updated information on the topic, but. Do watch Garbage Dreams if you want to learn about, um, you know, how Western recycling plans are not as efficient as they could be in terms of making use out of everything they could. Uh, this guy likes watching recyclables go on, go by on a conveyor belt, and he's not allowed to recycle them as part of his job. So. But here's something positive. There's another documentary called Garbage Warrior. There's a guy in New Mexico named Mike Reynolds who built something called Earthship. <laughs> doing it since about the 70s 
And this documentary, Garbage Warrior, shows him lobbying the New Mexico state government to allow experimentation in new types of architecture. So basically the types of uh, sustainable architecture that he was trying to build, they weren't illegal in New Mexico. So he got the government to pass a law allowing it. Um, Mike Reynolds patented a brick made out of six aluminum cans tied together with twine. And he takes, he makes these recyclables not only into livable houses, but works of art. Uh, and take multicolored glass bottles, you can make mosaics out of them. You have the sunlight come through the wall made out of glass bottles. He has walls made out of tires and glass bottles and it uh, retains heat. And he packs the tires with uh, dirt or sand, I think dirt. Um, so he makes these houses that don't need cooling or heating and uh, don't even need doors, I think. You can just walk right into them. They stay about 75 degrees. Um, make make sure it gets enough uh, southern light like the windows facing south so you get enough sunlight natural sunlight so he comes up with natural ways to heat and cool these houses again it's a garbage warrior and the other one was called garbage dreams thanks for thank you very much okay mike you're next about four minutes maybe four or five minutes because i know charlie's gonna have a rebuttal too okay not long I hate to do this to you folks, but I'm going to give you some information from Environment Studies 101, actually 501, graduate level. I know, I, everybody's mumbling. Okay, first of all, uh, okay, water will always be on Earth. You can pollute it. But the volume of it will always be the same. It'll be here billions of years from now. It never disappears. Somebody tell me if that's true for oil. No. Oil will burn and it's gone forever. Pollution. Okay, so things are either recyclable, reusable or they're not. So, glass is recyclable, it's reusable, it will return to the earth as a non-polluting product. Plastic will forever be used as oil or natural gas. It has chemicals and poisons and it never disappears. I enjoyed Janice's, Janice? Janet. I liked your PowerPoint at the end. It seemed like it was about plastics. We got, you know, I, sometimes we get off topic in this group. And we start talking about climate change. Charlie wanted to talk about climate change and global warming. Well, and does too. That's okay. Tangentially, it's related. But we're here for plastics. Plastics are probably the number two problem after oil. We go to war for oil. We go to war with plastics oil. oil. Did you know that more plastics are made from natural gas than oil? Well, natural gas is oil too, isn't it? <laughs> natural gas is for heating, for cooking, and for plastics. And from where does it uh, derive? From the earth. It's a fossil fuel. Don't ever confuse fossil fuels and energy. The, the dumb media and the smart media, they think they're smart, all label them the same thing. They are not the same thing. It's, but, but it's a all, fossil fuel, just like uranium. True. No, uranium is not a fossil fuel. You got to get out of the earth. The main fossil fuels are coal, which is used for making steel and for electricity. Oil, which is for our dirty airplanes and dirty cars, to run those. Natural gas is for cooking heat and plastics. They have very different extraction methods, very different uses, except you'll hear 
the fake New York news, the fake national news, even your beloved BEZ and PBS, where they have plenty of fake news too. They don't research well. And they'll say it's all the same thing. Energy. Fossil fuels. They're all, no, they all have different issues. We will never go to a war for coal in America. However, we've been to many wars for oil in America. Okay? We'll never go to a war for natural gas. Okay? But we will go to war. Yeah, yeah, because it's nasty. It's war for gas. No, we get a we have a domestic supply of natural gas. We import fifty percent of our oil from. So what you're. So what are you saying is about natural gas? You, the re Ukraine war is about natural gas pipelines and about oil pipelines, and the same thing with Palestine. That the Palestine war is about pipelines. The canal, the Ben Gurion Canal. It's about oil. It's not. It's not about Jews hating Muslims or any of that. Whatever that crazy media issues is. It's about oil pipelines because that's good cash revenue for Russia, for Ukraine, for Israel, for Palestine. Those are oil wars. Again, we spent trillions under Bush training. Yeah, don't give me that shaking the head stuff, Tim. I know the truth hurts. I can feel your pain. That's because you're dead wrong. <laughs> you are <laughs> wrong. You're completely wrong. Are a problem. The problem is single-use plastics. Coke bottles, plastic, uh, Pepsi bottles, bottled water where people walk out of jewels with like four dozens in their arms. It's stupid. Plastic cups, styrofoam. Is this single use? No, we've been using this for 30 years. Is that amplifier single use? No, he's been using that for 20 years. All that is not, it's fine. It's not single use. Bottles, mostly it's drinking bottles are the big problem. If you're freaked out about the, the lie about lead and water, get a filter, get two filters. I've been drinking Lake Michigan water for about 80 years. Oh, 60 years, sorry. All right, Mike, we got to wrap it up. Charlie, you're going to go next. Oh, my God, I have more, more to say. No, yeah, you don't make any sense. No. <laughs> All See, right. Charlie, that's why we need you here. Okay, Charlie. Listen, I miss you. I'm going to give you about two or three minutes, Charlie, because I'm going to wrap okay, up. So you All know, right, thanks, Mike. Okay. Okay. Mike. Right. All right, I, I've got four things I, I'll cover, right? First of all, I want to thank Janice Tony. for persevering and coming through uh, adversity and finding your way here. That's we thank you very much, and for putting together the PowerPoint and putting together a very nice presentation. Thank you very much from the college. We appreciate it. The Mike number one, Mike has got into this trap now that everything in foreign affairs is attributable to petroleum. Every war is for petroleum. Every activity of uh, the convenient omnibus explanation, even if it's a square peg and a round hole, this is a, called an obsession. I see this at the college all the time. Everything is attributed to his particular obsession, his legitimate concerns about petroleum, but it's not an explanation for every event in the world. Number two, I agree with Russ. Metal deposits of single-use plastic. I'm glad Mike mentioned that. We haven't used the terminology here. But you've got to avoid single-use plastic. And a deposit on that mandated by the government is a good idea. And why is it a good idea? Number one, it does not likely to be thrown in the ocean and lakes, and we are in the Great Lakes Basin, or end up in streams and rivers. So it's very crucial. We don't want we don't want the Great Lakes full of plastic. 
We've got a lot of investment in this lakes here, and we don't need to be full of plastic and all the fish eating plastic nobules. So it's a good idea here in particular. Now the real advantage for us to a recycling, people bring their bottles to a recycling center and Joe hit on it too. The plastics are separated at the recycling center. And it's not like in a recycling, we, Joe, um, Tom Shepard and I had a Saturday tour. We put together and rented a bus and we went to recycling centers around Chicago. And they have a line, they dump the plastic like in Chicago on a, on a, on a line that's running pretty fast. And the people are expected to separate all the different kinds of plastic. And they do pretty good. They have to get 95% um, in order to make a bale and make it saleable. You've got to separate the different kinds of plastic, as Joe said. And at a recycling center, they do that very accurately. And there's no time pressure. And as items come in, they're separated. And those are the most effective things. It's the major thing is you really want to recycle bottles, though. That would do a lot. And yes, there's an awful lot of bottles, as I said, 20 billion a day. All right. And last thing is, um, if we're going to do anything, I offer solution to a problem. And it's not just bottled water. Look in a grocery store. All the containers in a grocery store, mayonnaise, ketchup, uh, chocolate syrup, all the things in the in the produce department, in the bakery department as well, clamshell, plastic. There are three locations you got to target and persuade them to get rid of the plastic. Like here, mayonnaise always used to be in glass, Elman's mayonnaise, and now it's plastic. Or, or McCormick mayonnaise, plastic again. Three locations which the activists should target is grocery stores, drug stores or pharmacies, and convenience stores. If we tell these people, convince them. Now, the last one I want to add, I there's a lot about restaurants and fast food. I personally don't think that amounts to very much, if at all, to correcting the problem. And I think you're just kind of feel good waste time. I don't think restaurants and fast food operations are the target here of any meaningful target for achieving what we want is the end of use. Like here, a little stack of styrofoam there and a restaurant has nothing to do with the 50,000 bottles in a grocery store. Little okay. stack. That's all right. All right, thank you very much, Janice, and turn it over. Hey, Janice, um, if you want to come up and uh, give your final words here tonight, and I'll adjourn the college. Come on up, Janice. You got the you got the last word in. Okay. Janice. All right, Janice. When you're ready, come on up. I wanted to share with you. Uh, something I got from the Environmental <laughs> Defense Fund yesterday in the mail. Uh, it's uh, about a satellite that will hone in on methane so that it can be trapped and eliminated. <laughs> and uh, those flares that come from oil export, uh, you know, exploitation, uh, you know, we can stop them. <laughs> So, Environmental Defense Fund is doing that. Yeah. Um, so, thank you so much for hosting me. I'm sorry I was so late. <laughs> I'm going to Daphne's question after the piece. And I'm not familiar with the North Side. <laughs> so, anyway, those are all the. Let's thank Janet again for coming. Okay. Very good, Chuck. Very good. All yeah, right. Charlie, go ahead and adjourn us. All right, everyone. Hope to see you next week when Joe will be here for our special May Day. May Day, comrades. See you next week. Thank you for coming tonight. We'll see you all next week. Take care.
and don't pollute.